Okay, everybody, welcome to our, our show this afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to say, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to put them into the, into the Q&A, or you can save them till the end um, and ask them at the end too. Either way is, is fine. Um, and whatever we, uh, we, at the end of the show, we'll have a half an hour question and answer session. And anything that we, we don't get to there, we're gonna try to answer over Twitter over the next day or so. And our Twitter handle is at Carlton Science. Okay, so let's get started. Whew. Hi everybody and welcome to the 14th annual Carleton University Chemistry Magic Show. My name is Jeff Magic Manthorpe and on my left here I have another professor in our department and the chair of our department, Bob Blow It Up Burke. Hi everybody, welcome to our show. <clears throat> All right, so you're probably wondering what the heck that was that uh, I just did. Uh, that was something called flash paper. Now, you can get a close up of that here. You can see that that just looks like streamers that you'd put up at a kid's birthday party. Uh, and that's exactly what they were. Now, when you buy them at the store, they're on the package it actually says flame resistant. Uh, clearly that's no longer the case. But when you buy it, the paper is actually treated with a, uh, some chemicals called flame retardants that don't actually burn very well. So the paper won't actually burn unless you're actually holding a flame right against it. If you take the flame away, they stop burning. Now, so what do we do to take them from that to this? where you can see there's no smoke, no ash, nothing. Nothing even really hits the floor. Well, what we did, and we can talk about this at this kind of a level because you guys are in grade 11 and 12, is we installed extra nitrogen and extra oxygen um, in, uh, into the molecule. And so when we do that, it needs less oxygen from air in order to burn, so it burns more cleanly. And by installing extra nitrogen in there, um, it, uh, it releases a lot of energy because that nitrogen gets converted to nitrogen gas. So it also generates quite a bit of heat. Um, so that's how we can take certain organic compounds, whether it's something like cellulose in paper, and we make things like nitrocellulose, which is what this is. Um, or we can take things like toluene and add nitro groups to that and make trinitrotoluene, which is better known as TNT. Okay, so I'm guessing you might want to see that demonstration one more time with a slightly larger amount. So why not? We'll use up the last of it. Here we go. Whew. All right, so that's Flash paper, also known as nitrocellulose. What do you got, Bob? That's pretty cool. I have a reaction here, which since you're taking high school chemistry, you can appreciate because you know that we can make things with different concentrations. And in these five beakers, I have different concentrations. Likewise, these five. We're gonna dump the back into the front. One, two, three, go. And I want you to keep your eye on all five beakers. Starting with this one. Now, that was a timed reaction, and it's time because, and those two, and this one, and finally this one. These are timed because this one, <clears throat> there we go. They're timed because they have different concentrations of reagents getting lower and lower, so the reaction goes more slowly, and therefore it takes more time to turn on that dark blue color, which is a, um, a complex of the triiodide ion and starch. That always gives you that nice blue color. Can you beat that? Well, I can try. I mean, this is a bit of a holiday show, so why don't we do a bit of a holiday reaction? Um, so this is a, a clock reaction. Uh, it's, it's not a Christmas one, the, our next upcoming holiday, but if we go backwards, you know, our most recent holiday was really Halloween. So if we think about the colors for Halloween, uh, we're thinking orange and black. So I'm gonna try to do a clock reaction. We'll go see this orange and black. So I'll put these 
that in there, give that a bit of a swirl. Okay, and now in with this one. I don't see anything. Don't the clock reaction. We oh. gotta wait. Oh, beauty. And looks like orange juice. Black. Very cool chemistry. Yeah. So, cheers. Yeah. Actually, no. Uh, so that yellowy orange color there was actually mercury iodide. Uh, so, uh, if I were to actually drink that, it would be more like mercury iodide. Uh, very good. How about this one? This time we have a series of reactions going on in this beaker. So you'll see a bit of a yellow color initially, but then we get that dark blue, which is that starch triiodide, but don't take your eyes off it um, because we have other elements, other reagents in here, which then chew up the starch iodide complex and the solution turns back to a clear or yellow. But then another reaction takes over and pushes the starch complex back into prominence. So this is called an oscillating chemical reaction for obvious reasons. It will oscillate back and forth for about 20 minutes. We'll probably get, oh, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 cycles out of it before finally a, a reagent is used up um, and the reaction stops. There are many variations on this that you can find on YouTube, um, but they, most of them use some rather exotic chemicals. So you might have trouble doing this at home. That's why we like to do, do it for you here. How about that? All right. I think it's time for uh, to blow something up. What do you think? I like blowing stuff up. You people at home want us to blow something up? Yeah, I hear hundreds of people saying. So we're going to start with a small blow up. I'm handling this very carefully because this is quite unstable, this substance. So what you can see here are three filter papers with a, a brown spot in the middle of each one. And that brown spot is a solid material called nitrogen triiodide, Ni3. And Ni3 is so unstable that it just takes the touch of a feather. I don't have a feather, but I'll just touch it with a spatula to cause it to decompose. And it does so into nitrogen gas and iodine gas. And the iodine gas is purple, so you're going to see a bit of a purple cloud. I'm only going to touch one of these. And that small explosion is going to create a shock wave, which is going to set the other two off as well. So watch for the purple gas. There we go. See that purple cloud around us now? That's the iodine coming out. And note that we went from one mole of solid to four moles of gas. So there's a huge expansion in volume, and that's what you perceive as an explosion. Um, and that just puts a hole in all of these. The, it's a, a lot of energy released in a short time, uh, and you perceive that as an explosion. That's Ni3. Shock explosives, quite shocking, <laughs> if you like. Okay, so now we'll try something that you can do at home. Okay, so slime was a pretty big deal a couple years ago. Um, so you may have made some. I've heard of enterprising young uh, students who actually made money making slime uh, for friends. Um, so how do we do it? Well, one way is you start with borax here. So uh, borax is a, is a type of laundry detergent. Uh, and then what you need is a polymer. So polymer means poly means many, mer means unit. So there's many units to a polymer molecule. So it's the same repeating unit over and over and over again. And one of the, the ways that uh, commercial slime is made, so if you were to actually go buy it uh, at a store, it's, it's primarily made with a polymer called polyvinyl alcohol. Um, but uh, in this case, we're gonna make some using uh, household glue. So this is just multi-purpose white glue uh, that we have here. And you may need to experiment with it a little bit, maybe add a little bit of water to the glue, uh, but you wanna get the ratio right. And so the polymer that's in uh, wood glue or white glue like this is actually a biological polymer uh, called collagen. So, uh, you know, there's the, the long-standing joke about, you know, old horses being sent to the glue factory. Well, that was because uh, we would actually extract the, the collagen uh, from their tissues and use it to make glue. So, what we're going to do here is pour this in and we're going to cross-link the 
collagen molecules with the borax. So the borax basically can reach out and grab multiple collagen molecules and cause them to interact with each other and that makes it very thick and gooey basically slime. Ugh, gross. So yeah, kind of reminds me of what my two-year-old daughter was producing earlier this week. Uh, so yeah, there's some fun with some basics of household slime. Good stuff. Okay, what do you got, Bob? What I have here is another explosion because I know everybody loves explosions. Um, if Jamie can switch to the overhead camera, please. You see here that I have a bottle label, labeled NA. I'm sure all you chemists at uh, high school know that that's sodium. It's down the left-hand side of the periodic table. These are very reactive elements, including sodium. So I'm going to show you how reactive it is. I'll take a piece of sodium metal out of here. There it is there. You can see it's just kind of dull and gray. Um, and we keep it under oil. That's oil inside the uh, bottle. And that's to keep it away from water. You're going to see why in a moment. So I'm going to cut this. It cuts like hard butter. It's not a very hard metal at all. If I cut that open, you can see that nice shiny surface there. So that's so sodium that hasn't oxidized and hasn't been exposed to oxygen or water. I'll cut another one just in case we need to. Oop, or even if we don't need to, I'm going to do it twice. Put that away. And I'll take a piece like this, and if Jeff can get the lights, I'll drop this into a cylinder containing about 10 centimeters of water. It's hissing, it's bubbling, it's smoking a little bit. Oh, I saw a little flash of flame. There we go. Now this is a metal. In the same sense that iron is a metal, but iron wouldn't do that in water, would it? Iron would take a long time to react. Let me just move that around a little bit. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. The safest way to get rid of sodium you is to put it in water. You want a little more air in there? Yeah, let's, uh, if you can do that. Jeff's just going to blow out the gases that are in there because we need oxygen for this to happen too. So what's happened is that the sodium gets oxidized. Uh, that should do it. And the hydrogen in the water gets reduced and forms hydrogen gas which then combines with the oxygen and explodes. There's a flame, that's hydrogen burning. And then if we're lucky, it'll explode. Oh, this is just a nice, oh, there we go. So this is why the firemen, whoop, that's more like it. This is why the firemen want to know what's in our labs. If there's a fire and there's sodium exposed, they shouldn't come in and spray water on it. So that's sodium and water. Okay, so let's keep going on the topic of sodium. And a spot where we can find sodium in real life is on salt and vinegar potato chips. Not sodium metal, but salts of it. So sodium ions are the most common metal ion on earth, right? When you think about all the salt that's in the ocean, and the overwhelming majority of it is sodium chloride. Okay, there is many, 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 many mountains of sodium on Earth. Okay, now, the salt that's in here is actually uh, sodium acetate. And sodium acetate is found on salt and vinegar chips uh, because what we can do with that is the sodium ion and the sodium acetate gives us that salty flavor, and the acetate ion gives us the, the vinegar flavor, but rather than using acetic acid, uh, which would make our, our chips very soggy, and nobody likes soggy potato chips, so we just use the salt and it keeps them dry, and we get both at the same time. Now what I have here is a solution of sodium acetate, but sodium acetate in water exhibits a very interesting property known as uh, supersaturation. So if I add in just a little bit more sodium acetate here, 
I heated it up with a little bit of water and now there's more dissolved in there than really should be, it should be able to dissolve. So if I put in a little bit more, you can see it all comes crashing out in a big hurry. Okay, and this is also an exothermic process, so this is nice and warm uh, on my hands, and you can see nothing left. Okay, now another fun way that uh, we, can, we can show this demonstration is actually in the dark. Okay, so what I have here is a little black light, and you can see that the sodium acetate there is glowing. Uh, that's not sodium acetate itself. It's because it contains a bit of uh, a chemical called fluorescein, which is a, a fluorescent dye, as the name implies. Um, now, where would you encounter fluorescein? Uh, at your optometrist or ophthalmologist. Um, if you've scratched your cornea or they suspect that you've scratched your cornea, this is the front of your eye, uh, they'll put a, a couple drops of a fluorescein solution in your eye and it will actually get stuck in the scratch on the front of your eye. And so uh, when they just put a, a mild UV light in front of you, so, or a black light, um, which is the same thing, uh, they'll see it stuck and they'll see, be able to see the scratch. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour this out and there's some sodium acetate on the bottom here, in there, and so you can see it instantly crystallizes as I pour it, and we can make a great big tower of sodium acetate. And I will be able to pick that up, put it back in the flask, heat it back up, and use it again. So that's fluorescent sodium acetate. What do you got, Bob? You got some more sodium fun? I do, more sodium fun. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that what Jeff just said is important. That's a reversible reaction. We're going to see a few of those today. All right, the gadget that I have here with two forks is used for the next demonstration, which we call the electric pickle. So I have a jar here of Strub's kosher, picker, po kosher pickles naturally fermented. We've had this jar for many years, unrefrigerated. But we don't eat them, so we don't really care what they taste like. But let me pull one out here. I guess this guy will do it. Oh, that's only a half a pickle. We want a whole pickle. Here we go. And I'm going to impale this pickle on these two forks. Yeah, maybe like that. I think we will use a half because it's falling apart after seven or eight years. Now, how do you make a pickle? You take a cucumber and you soak it in brine, which is a solution of sodium chloride. So there's a lot of sodium in here. And I want to show that that sodium is here by <laughs> applying an electric potential across this. This is why we call it the electric pickle of about 100 volts between these two forks. So if Jeff could get the light, I'll crank up the voltage here. And we'll see what we see. There, now that color, that yellow color, is indicative of sodium. You've seen this before um, because you've seen street lights that are this yellow color. They work in almost the same way. They don't contain pickles, they contain sodium metal. And the sodium metal gets excited by the electrical current. And when the atoms de-excite, when they lose their energy, they do so by the emission of light of exactly this color. So if we see this color, we know sodium is present. And by how intense the light is, we can tell how much sodium is there. So this is an example of spectroscopy, which we use day in, day out in the laboratory to analyze samples for various elements. So remember that yellow color, you're going to see it again. Okay. Okay. All right. So, all of us at one point were babies. And babies wear diapers, right? So, ever wondered how a diaper works? Well, we're going to show you. So, what I have here are three cups. Okay. And now we're going to do a little bit of magic. So, about 100 milliliters of water, maybe even a little bit more. We'll just pour it in there. Mm. 
remember where the water is. Okay. So, give you about five seconds to type something in the in the Q and A if you think you know where it is. Nobody knows. I say it's in the left one. Left one. Okay. No. Uh, the other left. The other left. No. Well, then obviously it's in the middle. No. Oh, come on. So, the key to this demonstration is actually another polymer. Uh, this one is called a super absorbent polymer. And here I have some, uh, a sample of it, so it's just small particles here. But what we can do is we can put those behind a, a, a tight cloth mesh in a diaper. And then when a baby pees, well, that's about 300 milliliters there. We'll give that a quick little stir. You can see just how quickly it traps the water. So this, this polymer here is extremely hydrophilic, so it loves water. It soaks it right up. This is a polymer called sodium polyacrylate. And you can see it's not quite, there we go. There, it's now gelled enough that I can hang it upside down like this and nothing comes out. Okay, so how much did I put in there? That was about 20 grams of, uh, of that uh, polymer. Now that 20 grams is enough to hold and, and gel close to you know, one to two liters of water. Okay, uh, you know, urine, because it contains some other salts and some other things, uh, it would actually hold a little bit less than that. But Basically, we don't even put that much uh, of that polymer into diapers because if we did, it could hold so much urine that the kid couldn't actually move around because the diaper would be so full uh, with all the, all the urine that it would hold. The baby would never wake up. Yeah. Kind of change topics a little bit. This is more of a physics demo than a chemistry demo, but chemistry is certainly important when we talk about radioactive substances. So I have here a Geiger counter and a small sample of uranium in the form of uranium trioxide, a yellow powder. So uranium is naturally radioactive. There's radiation coming out of this as we speak in the form of alpha particles, which are two neutrons and two protons, beta particles, which are electrons, and gamma particles, which are high intensity photons, high energy photons. And that's what's detected by this particular Geiger counter. We're only going to detect the gamma particles, the photons. So this is the actual detector. There's a window here. The photons will get into this. They'll create electrons inside the tube, which are gathered by the meter and displayed. So if I bring this close to this, each one of those clicks that you hear is one radioactive particle, one photon that's gotten out of the uranium through the glass, through the window of this detector, and has created some electrons in here for us to detect. So I'm going to put this here, and you can understand, or you can pretend that this is you. So the radiation is getting into you. And I want to talk about how you protect yourself from radiation. One way is just to move away from it. And the further away you get, the amount of radiation goes down as the square of the distance of you between you and the source. If you get quite close, you're going to intercept a lot of the radiation. If you get far away, you'll intercept very little of it. Another way is to put some mass between you and the source. So I've just got a bottle of water here, and if I put that between the source and the detector, the radiation detected here, and that's you in this experiment, virtually stops. So if you're concerned about a radioactive source, you put mass between you and it, and that's what happens at the dentist's office when they put that lead apron on you, or when the technician goes around behind the wall, behind a window which contains a lot of lead that protects him or her or you simply move a further distance away from it. So a lot of interesting things, a lot of interesting chemistry in this as well, especially the production of, of uranium compounds like this. 
And this is, uh, this is a course that we teach at Carleton, having to do with radioactive substances. So that's the Geiger counter. So one of the, one of the things that I've always found fascinating about uranium, too, Bob, by the way, mm. um, is you know, it's, uh, it's found in trace amounts in cigarettes, huh. right? And so from the soil, it gets taken up by the plant and uh, then when you, when you burn the plant and you inhale the, the smoke and the tar that, that comes from the, uh, the plant, that trace amount of uranium actually winds up in your lungs. Hmm. Another, another reason not to smoke. Another reason not to smoke. You know, yeah, let's just take a deep breath of this radioactivity here. <laughs> okay, speaking of taking a deep breath, Bob and I are gonna have a little bad breath contest here. So notice that mine is pink and Jeff's is clear initially. It's also known as the windbag demonstration. University professor being windbags. So mine's turning blue here. So Bob's is getting more and more colorless. Right, wait a minute, mine's not as blue as it used to be. What's going on here? Well, seeing as you guys are in grade 11 and 12, you, I guess you've actually studied some things like redox. So one of the things that uh, is going on with this reaction here is in there is a dye called methylene blue. And methylene blue has two forms. One is uh, an oxidized form that's blue and a reduced form that's colorless. The, uh, so what I have in here is, in with the methylene blue, is some glucose and potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide and glucose combine to make a reducing agent, so it actually reduces the methylene blue to the colorless form. Now we can oxidize it back to the blue form by exposing it to oxygen that I was exhaling or I can pick it up and just shake it, and the oxygen in the air in the flask is enough to turn it, oxidize it and turn it blue. And now because of the reducing agent in solution, it's going to go colorless again here in a moment. Uh, and that's one of the cool things about methylene blue. So that's another reversible reaction like I was speaking about earlier when Jeff did the sodium acetate. This one is as well, but it's acid-base chemistry. So when I blew into this, carbon dioxide in my breath combined with water to make carbonic acid, and that changed the color of the acid-base indicator to the acidic color, and I can put it back into its basic color by adding some strong base, goes back to the pink color. So this is reversible as many times as you want. Add acid, it's gonna go clear. Add base, it's gonna go pink. It's a reversible reaction. Now, speaking of some, some fun color demonstrations, I'm gonna take this with me here, walk over here. All right, it's time for some fun Christmas deck demonstrations. Okay, so we've got a nice blue color here. Um, but if we were gonna have, we had some Halloween colors earlier uh, as, as a holiday color, orange and black. But if we're gonna do Christmas, well, I think if we were gonna have colors for Christmas, I think everybody would probably agree that red and green and maybe some silver. So let's do that, okay? So I've got some silver in there already. I'm gonna pour in some green. And now I'm gonna pour in some red. And if I pour this gently, you can see that it will layer on top of it. And we've got our three layers. So a nice Christmassy demonstration. Keep talking, my friend. But it's a little more, there's a little more to the story than that. Because what I can actually do, this isn't just three layers because I poured them gently on top of each other. I can actually shake it up. And I can get my three layers back. Okay, so you can see the red layer on top pretty quickly. 
And here comes the green one. There we go. Okay, so what's actually going on here? Well, on top here, I have an organic solvent. The, so it's uh, oleophilic, hydrophobic. It's toluene. And to, uh, in the toluene, I put a red dye called Sudan 3. The middle layer is uh, water that contains a little bit of green food coloring and a green salt, nickel chloride. And then the bottom is good old mercury. Okay, and I don't know, because you guys are in grade uh, 11 and 12, you know, maybe you've had access to a little bit of mercury and been able to actually try this for yourselves. But right here, I have about half a liter of it. And it's one of these things that when you try to pick it up, your brain just says, this does not compute. This does not make sense. Because you're looking at it and you're looking at how much volume is there and then you pick it up and the weight of it just seems absurd. So this half liter probably weighs about six kilograms. Okay, so it's, if you were to try to pick it up with one hand, you, your first instinct would be to think it's actually glued to the table. But of course, it's not. It's just extremely dense material. Good stuff. All right, we're going to make a Christmas ornament since we're so many days before Christmas, nine days before Christmas. What I have in this flask is a bit of a sugar solution. And this is an example of another redox reaction. The sugar is going to be the reducing agent. Um, and in here, I've got some silver ions. And so I'm going to pour this in here. The silver is going to get reduced. The sugar gets oxidized. And the sugar products we don't really care about, but the silver getting reduced gives us a nice effect because it gets reduced to silver metal. And the silver metal is going to plate out on the inside of this flask. Slowly but surely, we're going to create a silver Christmas ornament. This is the way mirrors used to be made. They would reduce silver ions on the back of a piece of glass. Um, nowadays, apparently, it's done using aluminum instead of silver. Um, but you can see that nice silver layer forming. Slowly but surely, the silver comes out of solution. This is also reversible. I can put some acid in this and dissolve the acid back. No, dissolve the silver back to make silver ions again. Oops. But you can see there, if Jeff comes around here, you can see our reflections in the silver ball. Kind of an expensive and elaborate way of making a Christmas decoration, but um, great chemistry. Love the effect that this gives us. Yeah. Silver metal, where there wasn't any five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our last Christmassy demonstration, I'm gonna need Bob to turn out the lights for me here. All right. And I'm gonna just I can do duck that. down behind the counter here. Okay, so if you were to think about other uh, sorts of Christmas decorations we would ha we use, well, people <coughs> often like candles. So here's a fun one you can do at home. Take your candle, blow it out, and then... Oh, don't eat the candle, Jeff. Ah, oh, Jeff. Take a big bite. Oh, come on, who eats candles? I do. <laughs> okay, I think that needs an explanation. Okay. So the first recommendation I would have would be get a candlestick that's got some wax drippings on it or something, and then you take a piece of banana and you put a pecan on top. So half a pecan, really, technically. Okay, and now Pecans, uh, being nuts, contain oil. And that oil, just like other oils, well, it'll burn. And so I'm gonna, you can do this with a, just a household lighter, it's a little trickier, but I'm gonna do it here just with a blowtorch because it's what I've got. And you just light it, and now there's enough oil in that nut that it will burn for several minutes. Okay, so now I'll just blow it out. Make sure your mouth isn't too dry so you don't burn your tongue. And then take a good bite and making sure to get a good bit of banana again so you don't burn your mouth.
and it's a roasted nut candle. So you've, e you've eaten eight of those in the last two days. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> where Jeff gets most of his calories. Yeah. All right, how about we blow something up? Yes, I can hear people saying. What I have here is a copper cylinder. And this is hollow. It has about a two centimeter diameter hole at the bottom and about a one millimeter hole at the top. Otherwise it's hollow, made out of copper, soldered together. I'm gonna put that there and we're gonna actually fill this cylinder with hydrogen gas. So I've got some hydrogen here. I'll put it up the bottom, block it off so it has to go in. So we'll make sure this gets nice and full, displaces all the air. Give it a bigger blast. Ah, now we're talking. That should do it. All right, and I'll hold my finger over it while Jeff lights the lighter, and we're gonna light the top of this. So a little flame there. So what's happening is the hydrogen is burning off at the top, and that's drawing air in at the bottom. It's displacing the hydrogen. So the mixture inside is changing. It's going from pure hydrogen towards pure air, but it's not going to quite get there, as you'll see. Hopefully you can see that little flame at the top. And in a moment, it'll start to make an interesting noise, so I will bring my microphone up to it. It'll start to buzz in a moment. And that's because hydrogen burns off at the top and then air gets sucked in. Hydrogen burns off, air gets sucked in. So it starts to vibrate to oscillate. There it goes. Well, in fact, we call this the hydrogen bomb. Sorry, I don't have enough of these to go around. Lean forward. Go like this, listen carefully. Oh! Maybe it's hard to tell from where you are, but close up, that's like a shotgun going off beside your ear, right beside your ear. So we call that the hydrogen bomb. It's fun blowing stuff up, eh? We scare the pants off people out in the hall. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so let's head on over here, and I'm gonna show you another one you can do at home if you've got a black light, okay? or a UV flashlight or any any sort of UV source okay and what I have here is just some regular liquid laundry soap and we've all seen the ads about laundry soap you know it gets your whites whiter and your colors brighter kind of uh, commentary okay so just plain old liquid laundry soap okay and now I'm gonna just turn off the light and you can see that that actually glows. And so the glowing there is actually fluorescence. So what's happening is there's a molecule in the, uh, in the soap that is absorbing the UV light, getting excited, and then when the molecule relaxes and gives off uh, the light again, the light that it's emitting is actually of a different frequency, a different wavelength. And that wavelength is as actually lower energy and it's energy that we can see. So in this case, it's, it's actually blue, okay? So the compound that's doing that is actually called umbelliferone. Um, and it actually uh, a little bit stays in your clothes, okay? And that's why your colors, the colors in your clothes do literally look brighter is because they're absorbing UV light uh, from around uh, the room or outside especially uh, when we're exposed to a little more UV light and then uh, it actually causes a fluorescence of this umbelliferone in your clothes and that's why uh, they look extremely bright or, or brighter than they would otherwise. Okay, you want to have some fluorescence fun too, Bob? Sure. If you take uh, most markers, colored markers, 
and mark a piece of paper, you'll find that the ink in those is, mo is usually fluorescent as well. So I've made a sign here that just says Merry Christmas, and it's in orange ink and various other colors. But when I hold it up to the UV light, it really comes alive. Notice that not only is the paper glowing, it's sort of a bluish color, you know, or my hand really isn't, just to show that it's not the black light itself that's glowing, but the paper itself is fluorescent, but so are the inks. And that's true of many colored compounds. Many such things are, are fluorescent. So that's fluorescence, but we've got a demo of something related, which is even more interesting, I would say. It's called phosphorescence. And for that, I have to get my two specially prepared pieces of paper out of the dark. We've been storing them in a garbage bag to keep them away from light. And this is something you're probably also familiar with if you've got a television remote control at home whose buttons glow in the dark. You probably notice that you have to leave them in the light for a while and they sort of charge up. And then when you go to find your remote control, you can find it because it has some phosphorescent compounds in it. So same idea here. Light can excite the molecules, and when they de-excite, they glow in the visible portion of the spectrum. But it persists, which is different from fluorescence. Here's a red laser pointer. Don't see anything. Red photons are low energy photons. They're not sufficiently energetic to boost up these phosphorescent molecules in order that they phosphoresce. But here's a blue laser pointer. Blue photons are much more energetic. So I'll try and spell something here. Hopefully I spell Carlton correctly. Carlton, that says. <laughs> so you can see that this persists. Now that's the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence. Flu fluorescence does not persist. Phosphorescence does. So the more I excite them, the more light I get back. Now Jeff has some flashlights which will do something similar. Yeah, so these are just uh, UV flashlights that I picked up at, um, at a, uh, a hardware store. Uh, as they were describing on the radio this morning, it rhymes with palladium fire. Um, and you can see that they also cause this phosphorescence phenomenon. So we have to just sign, uh, shine a wavelength of light um, or frequency that is of higher energy than the green light that's emitted. So UV light is definitely higher energy. So is blue light. Uh, and so that's why they work. But if we shine green or orange or red, uh, it's not enough. Even the green that's uh, the exact uh, color that's being emitted here is not enough to do this. You'll also notice that this is, you know, with the UV flashlights, it's the light is much more diffuse, right? Uh, whereas with the purple laser, uh, what's going on is with laser lights or the blue laser. Um, so lasers are extremely intense light. So that's why when we shine that on there, uh, if you've still got it, Bob, um, yeah, you can see that it's, it's much more intense. The emission there, uh, that phosphorescence is much more intense uh, than a simple UV light uh, or even a, a regular white light flashlight will do that as well. Okay, now before we leave the topic of fluorescence and phosphorescence, uh, I've got one more demo that you can do at home if you've got a black light. So what I have here is a bottle of tonic water. Okay, if you believe, trust me that that's the label off the bottle. You hold it under a, uh, a black light here. You can see that it's fluorescing. Okay, it's not the bottle. It's actually what's in the bottle. Okay. So let me just have a little beaker here just to prove that. Okay, so the control experiment, no fluorescence in the, in the beaker. Pour into the beaker and you can see it's definitely fluorescing. Okay, now oh, I've been talking a lot here. I'm just gonna have a drink. Wash down that banana. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's bitter. So the molecule that's in here that's actually fluorescing is called quinine, also pronounced quinine, uh, which is a tonic for malaria. Um, but there's not enough in here to actually 
uh, treat malaria, you'd have to probably drink about 30 liters a day. Um, and if you drink 30 liters a day of anything, you're going to wind up in the hospital with what's called water intoxication because all the electrolytes in your body are going to be uh, screwed up and it can actually kill you. Oh, Jeff, jeez. Uh, so, I'm, sorry, I'm a bit of a slob. Um, how are my teeth? Well, they're sort of yellowish greenish today. Oh, okay. <laughs> because of fluorescence. Yeah. Um, so, get yourself a bottle of tonic water and a black light. And also, you guys are getting close to being of legal age. So when you go out, if you go out to a bar uh, where there are black lights, if you order a gin and tonic, it'll fluoresce like this. Okay. So that's fluorescence. What are we going to do now? Oh, related phenomenon, chemiluminescence. Let me just move my microphone back here. Hey, you didn't try that one. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, a reaction where instead of giving off heat, it's going to give it off as light. So, ready? One, two, uh, whoops, sorry. Pull start. One, two, three, go. So what's happening now is we've added some, uh, what, uh, what was hydrogen peroxide into a solution of a couple other chemicals, uh, including luminol. And so if you've ever watched CSI, uh, one of the many CSI series, you know that luminol can be used to detect blood because it will react with reactive oxygen species, including oxygen bound to hemoglobin uh, in blood, as well as the hydrogen peroxide that was in here. Okay, so that's chemiluminescence. And that's how glow sticks work, by the way, is through this same reaction. Uh, and if you want, we could even talk through the chemistry of that uh, at, in the Q&A. We did that this morning. Okay, what's up next? One of my favorites. So in this flower pot, I have sand around the outside. And inside, the reddish mixture is iron oxide and finely divided aluminum metal. And I've inserted a party sparkler in the middle here. So this reaction between the iron oxide and the aluminum metal is actually proceeding right now, but very slowly. To speed it up, we're going to light the party sparkler. A hot spark from that is going to fall into our reaction mixture and start that reaction. And in a couple of seconds, we're going to make molten iron, liquid iron. So this is a testament to the power that's inside a chemical bond. That much energy, the amount of energy that's going to be released from this is simply astonishing. I've done this demonstration maybe 200 times and it still amazes me. So I'll put that there. I've got a pot full of sand to catch whatever comes out the bottom here. Well, thanks. And I'll light the party sparkler. And a spark from that will land in the main mixture and start off the main reaction. And I want you to watch the main reaction and then also watch between the two pots. It's getting closer. One of those sparks is going to start it. There it goes. Now watch out the bottom of the top pot. There, that's liquid iron. In what was that? Three seconds. We went from whatever the mixture was, iron oxide and aluminum metal, to molten iron metal. And I can't even pick it up, it's still liquid, but there's a chunk of it. It's causing the sand to boil. So that's, that's still quite pliable, it's quite soft. I can bend it with my tongs. So in a matter of seconds, so much heat was released that the temperature went up enough to cause the products of this reaction, most of which is iron metal, to melt and fall out the bottom of our pot. The pot is still glowing red. You can probably see that if I turn it around here. It's going to stay hot for probably a half an hour before I can dispose of it. So that's called the thermite reaction. It's one of my favorites. Okay, and the time has come for our last couple of demonstrations. Um, before I s explain that, I want to take a moment to thank uh, our, our AV crew, as well as our communications team, uh, and some of the, uh, the lab coordinators around the department for helping uh, us to prepare and run this show. Uh, 
This is our fourth and final show over, uh, over the last two days. Uh, and we've uh, reached over 21,000 students in the last two days. Uh, so we're really appreciative of, uh, of the engagement and everyone's help in, in doing that. Uh, we really want to thank everybody for coming to the show. And this demonstration here, well, we're going to kind of abuse an M, a peanut M&M here. So in a peanut M&M, there are about 13 calories. So what does that look like in terms of energy? Well, that's kind of hard to say. You know, we, we don't really understand it. It's very kind of abstract. So I want to make that a little clearer for you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a chemical in here that I've melted. It's potassium chlorate. And we're going to use it to oxidize a peanut M&M, just like our, the way our body uses oxygen from air to oxidize our food and digest it. So, but instead of doing it over half an hour, an hour, maybe two hours, we're going to do it in about 15 seconds. So, on the outside in the chocolate, there are simple sugars. So that's about 700 degrees right now. And now it's oxidizing the peanut on the inside. The temperature's shooting up over 1,000 degrees Celsius. And as crazy as that was, most of the peanut is still there. <laughs> so we probably burned off about eight or nine calories there. Um, so you might want to think about that next time you sit down and eat a whole bag of M&Ms. It's the same amount of energy that your body gets when it digests it via a different mechanism. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay. And now our last demonstration, yeah, our little portable fume hood here doesn't like all the smoke. Saying, so just in case you haven't noticed, there's a fire in there. Well, now we're actually going to do a demonstration related to fireworks. Okay, nothing's going to explode here, but we are going to burn some stuff for sure. So in here, in these three bottles, I have mixtures of compounds that we're going to burn. Um, now, what is in a firework? Well, I'm just going to use all these up. Why not? We'll make a big mess. In a firework, you have three components. You have a lift charge, which lifts it up into the sky, as the name implies. We have a an explosive charge which makes the firework explode and then there's a metal salt in there that gets excited and gives off the color. Now the color of fireworks is actually really there's a really incredible science into the, behind this and if you've ever been to a fireworks show as most of us have you ever noticed that you don't really see blue fireworks? Well that's because it's a really tough color to do okay but you might re recognize some of the colors that uh, I'm going to show you here. You've, I'm sure you've all seen that orangey uh, yellow color from sodium ones. That's a really popular one at fireworks shows. This first one I'm going to show you is sort of got a purpley lilac color to it, and that's going to be potassium. In case you're wondering, we do have the smoke alarms turned off. Um, all right, and how about red? So this is strontium. Woo. Beautiful. Looks like That's a road flare. That's a good one. Now, I'm actually going to let some of the smoke clear out here. All right? Because this is our real showstopper. Hang on to your retinas for this one. This one's going to be really bright. Um, and this is our blue. Okay? This is a special copper formulation that actually keeps the temperature low enough that it actually stays blue in instead of blue-green. Okay? There. Come on. Let's get some of that smoke out of there. Woo! 
All right, here we go. Wow. Wow. It's like a flashbulb. Okay, that's our show, folks. Thank you very much for coming. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we're happy to take any questions you've got. Uh, and hey, you know, before COVID came along, we did this event for the public uh, here on campus, and our students uh, would help us run the show, uh, including hands-on activities. So, you know, if you come to Carleton and study chemistry, you get to actually do this stuff. We teach you how to do it and all the science behind it, uh, as well as a bunch of other cool stuff. You bet. So thanks for coming, and we'll, ha we'll happily answer any questions you got. Thanks for coming, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the show. Hey, don't be shy. Um, I saw a hand go up. You can just type in the uh, in the in the Q and A questions there. Um, so I see one there. How safe is that radioactive bottle? Um, so here it is. There's about a gram or two of uranium trioxide in here. I wouldn't hesitate to put that in my pocket. So most of the radiation doesn't even get out of the uranium. What does, most of that doesn't get out of the glass. And what does is a few photons, a few gamma rays. Now, it's not something that I would keep uh, maybe in my front pocket, especially if I was a child uh, wanting to bear age, if you know what I mean, um, because it can certainly affect reproductive organs. Um, but this is a very small quantity, and uranium is only mildly radioactive. There are many radioactive substances I would not uh, keep like this exposed or certainly put in my pocket. Depends on, <coughs> depends on the amount of radiation and the energy of the radiation, and both of those are rather low in this sample. That's a good question, though. Okay, and I see... Uh... <laughs> Moira's asking us to sing the periodic table. Yeah, I don't sing. Yeah, me either. <laughs> um, so what did we burn to make the blue flame? Look on YouTube if you want to see people singing the periodic table. Yeah. Uh, how do we make the blue flame? So the blue flame, um, so the, the problem, the challenge with getting a blue flame uh, is you need metals that are not really toxic um, to the environment. Um, you need ones that are relatively inexpensive. So uh, copper is certainly one of them. Um, some of the others that, that can give off a blue color are much rarer um, and therefore more expensive. But also, um, you have to get the temperature right. Uh, and so copper can give off a blue flame, but in order to do it, uh, you have to keep the temperature really low. Uh, if it gets too hot, it starts to get green. Uh, and so the, the mixture of components I, I used there, um, so it's uh, copper bromide, copper one bromide. So because copper, um, you guys are in grade 11 and 12, so copper has two oxidation states, right? There's copper one and copper two. Copper one is much better for giving um, a, uh, a, a nice blue color. Copper two does not, which is kind of ironic because um, Copper two salts and solids are nice blue ones, like copper sulfate. It's a beautiful blue color. Um, but uh, yeah, in fireworks, we need copper one species. They're not particularly stable. They tend to oxidize to copper two. So that's a tricky part. You don't want, so you gotta keep the temperature right. You gotta keep it low. Um, and so what we used was, uh, it's a mixture of copper bromide um, a, a couple, uh, an oxidant, a particular oxidant, and uh, a fuel. Um, but they're, they're not like household available by any means. I see a student named Moira has an excellent question. Ah. How does chemistry as a study impact society and how can it contribute to sustainability? That's a pretty mature question, Moira, but I'll do my best to answer that. 
We call chemistry the central science, which means it's connected to all the other sciences. It underpins, chem it underpins physics, it underpins biology, it underpins earth sciences, geology. You name it, chemistry is connected to it in some fashion. So if you become a chemist, you could do biological chemistry or, for instance, drug discovery chemistry. If you become a chemist, you could work in industry and you could produce new products, new materials, new things that make our, our iPhones smaller and more compact and more powerful than they were before. It's all based on materials chemistry. You could contribute to um, the reduction of um, global warming and climate change. Um, these are very much chemistry questions. So I could go on and on and on, but there are um, just really an, really an infinite number of disciplines that are connected to chemistry. And so, you know, in many disciplines, you'll get into that discipline, you might get a great job in it, but you're going to be a, little, a lot more narrowly focused than you would be if you were a chemist. As a chemist, you're going to be connected to all these other aspects of science and technology. So uh, it's a great career. And Jeff and I know this from experience. We're connected to things very much outside this building and outside what we're doing in our own labs. Um, the research is, is pertinent to so many other disciplines. So great question, Moira. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, a student who's just finishing uh, with me, they, they're not quite finished yet and they already have a, a, a permanent full-time job at, at Spartan here in Ottawa. Um, other people I know work at major pharmaceutical companies around the world. Um, so, yeah, in my particular area, which is uh, synthetic chemistry, so we, we actually are the ones who, who build molecules. Some people work in medicinal chemistry, where they make small amounts of a variety of molecules, and those get tested by biochemists and biologists to see if they would be good, uh, good drugs. And then there are other people who work in process chemistry, where they have now to make one molecule really well. Uh, so the amount of material that, they, they, that is produced out of each reaction to make it is as high as possible, and the purity is very high. Um, so it's uh, the same sort of skills in making molecules, but you have to take a different approach. And you're trying to make you know, one molecule in as perfect a way as possible, as opposed to just making as many different ones as possible quickly. Mm. Um, yeah. Cheryl A has a practical question. How do you clean those flasks? You may have noticed that I've already stripped the silver off our Christmas ornament. I did that by putting some very uh, strong concentrated nitric acid in there and the silver metal simply dissolves. A little bit of a brownish gas in there is nitrogen dioxide. For the other ones that contain that starch iodide complex, this will just wash out in water. Mm -hmm. Down the drain. Yeah. The, uh, the light patterns and fireworks I see there, um, there's, there's an incredible amount of science that, that goes into that. Um, uh, so what they do is they actually pack the, the metal salts into small spheres or cylinders. Um, and so even what shape to pack them in and how big, there's a lot of science that goes into that. Those, the metal salt containing pieces, they actually call them stars, which if you stop and think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense, right? Like a star in the sky, it's this bright little ball of light. Um, and so there, there's actually quite a lot of science that goes into, into that and like what salt do you use um, and what sort of uh, lift charge and explosive charge and the shape of everything so that you get those different uh, uh, shapes in, in the fireworks. So it's, it's really about how the different components are packed together and, and what sort of shapes they're in. What else do we have here? Uh, where do we get the lab coats? Oh yeah. Well, we ordered them online. We didn't make them. Um, you know. Oh, we could have though. We could have. We're chemists. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I made some tie-dye clothes this summer, um, but um, yeah, we we ordered these online. Uh, I would tell you where we got them, but um, I do know that the place we got them doesn't sell them anymore. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but if if you just go online and and search for tie-dye lab coats, I'm sure you'll find a place that sells ones uh, like this or similar. Here's this Moira again. She's pretty precocious, isn't she? What yeah. were your areas of study? Uh, well, I, I'm a synthetic organic chemist, so I can make drugs. Um, 
you know, uh, most people with my skill set actually yeah, wind up in the, in the pharmaceutical industry um, trying to discover new medicines. So I, I took a lot of organic chemistry um, and I, I also took a lot of inorganic um, as well because a lot of reactions are promoted by, by metals, and metal catalysts. Um, I, I also took a lot of biology uh, and, and biochemistry. Um, so I've, I've taken courses in, uh, in human anatomy and physiology um, to, to help augment uh, my knowledge, as well as, uh, as botany. Uh, I've taken a lot of uh, plant courses um, to, to understand uh, how plants work. Uh, so I'm at the other end of the spectrum. I'm, I don't understand most of what Jeff does, organic chemistry and biochemistry and so on. I'm a physical chemist. I'm interested in what's going on at the atomic and the molecular level when sodium or silver plates out on this, or when the silver gets redissolved in the nitric acid. Why do reactions go at the speed that they go? Why is a certain amount of heat released or absorbed when a reaction happens? So those disciplines are physical chemistry. So I would have studied a lot of physical chemistry, quite a bit of math, and a little bit of physics as well to, uh, to understand what I do understand. Okay, I don't know that there's any other questions. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Please put them in the Q&A. And if not, I think I'm going to say thank you very much to Bob and Jeff for, for, a, for a great presentation this afternoon. I hope everybody learned lots and had a fun time, because that's important too. Um, yeah, a big thank you to everybody and happy holidays. Thanks to all the students and their teachers that were here. Yeah, thank hope you very you enjoyed much. enjoyed the show. Come back again.